The book of Jonah, the book of the revivalists in the Word of God. And uh, I, I would say that Jonah, I think without a doubt, I know of no other, Jonah preached the greatest revival on the face of this earth. No man preached and had the success, if you will, or the, uh, the result that Jonah had. We're talking about an entire city, and we're not talking about Florence, Kentucky. We're talking about a really big three-day journey to walk across this thing. There's hundreds of thousands of people in this city, and they all, they all went into sackcloth and ashes before. In fact, they put their cows in sackcloth. They put their parakeets in sackcloth and ashes. I'm talking about a show enough one-day sermon revival happened to the city of Nineveh. I want to read out this verse here and then we'll pray. In verse number uh, 2 of chapter 1, God comes to Jonah and says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Father, I pray to speak to our hearts tonight. Lord, we need you. God, draw us into thy presence like we haven't been in a while, Father. Lord, speak to every child of God. Lord, if there's someone lost listening, draw them unto salvation, I pray, even tonight. Uh, Lord God, that they would be saved. Father, I raise my hands to thee and bless thee. You're worthy, God, of praise and honor and glory at all times. But I praise you in the congregation of the righteous tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Revival is the intervention of God in the heart of a single human being or a nation. A study of historical revival leads one to recognize that revival is the greatest miracle of all. Without the intervention of God, there would be no life. Without the intervention of God, there would be no living, no vitality, no Christianity on the face of this earth. The mighty revival in Nineveh is recorded in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the chapter of number 3, in verse 4 and 5, how the, uh, Jonah began to preach into this city here. He entered in a day's journey and he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them uh, even to the least of them. When revival came, it shook them up to realize they're living a dead life they're living a life of sin and they crumbled before almighty God and pleaded for his mercy and God gave them mercy for what 100, 150 years because revival came to them Andrew Murray wrote this a true revival means nothing less than a revolution casting out the spirit of worldliness making God's love triumph in one's heart. <laughs> Boy, don't we need God's love like never before in our hearts. According to Martin and Lloyd Jones, a revival means days of heaven on earth. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. Revival's not a bad thing. God's stirring up and moving and doing great things on this earth through his people. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. As you think upon the future, there's so many what ifs. What if we thought about what if God sends a revival? I don't hear anybody talking about that what if. I'm hearing all kind of other what ifs, or they're doing this and they're going to do that. Well, what about what God's going to do in the midst of his people? The cries of revival here. I want to bring out four very quickly. I want to say, first of all, there's a need to cry aloud. The fear of God. In verse number two said, their wickedness has come up before me. I'm telling you, God is still God. And he's not, hey, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. God's still on the throne, and we need to cry out the fear of God. There was a, there was a commercialized cliche that came out, I, I think, maybe uh, early 80s, and it put on, everybody put on their bumper stickers, especially rednecks, put them all over. You probably got one on your car. And, and they put on there, no fear and uh, that got into the I really do believe it got into the psych, psyche of the children being raised 
And now we got a generation that has no fear of God whatsoever. But I'm telling you, we need to fear God. Uh, it, it is imperative that humanity fear God. They're going to push it till one day God's going to pour his wrath out on this earth and it ain't going to be a party. I mean, it's talking about the grapes of wrath trampled. I'm talking about blood spilled everywhere when God gets fed up with being irreverenced by the human race. There ought to be a cry among us for the fear of God. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. They talk about science, science, science. Believe the science. Well, I tell you, you won't know nothing yet until first you come to the place where you fear the almighty creator God that created the science that you're studying. There ought to be a healthy fear of God among God's people. And in that healthy fear of God, we cry out to the world the fear of God. Our cry to exclaim against by way of reproof. It's not okay to act like there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's not okay for this world to try to stamp God out. It, it, listen, and they won't be able to. I understand that, but they think they have. They think they are going to legislate God out, and it's not okay. There needs to, it takes a healthy fear of God upon the human race for the human race to operate right. We need Christians who will sound the alarm, the fear of God before the world. This is a heathenistic nation. This is a God unconscious Gentile nation. These people didn't even know God. Yet God called them into judgment before Him. God help us get the word out to the lost and dying world that's been taught there is no God, been taught to defame God. It don't matter whether they know God or not. The Bible said they'll stand before God in judgment. Hey, listen. They'll die one day and stand before God. And after this, the judgment, they're going to have to give an account. We need to cry out as God's people, Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord, God Almighty. Stephen Alford said this, Revival is an invasion from heaven that brings a conscious awareness of God. Upon this earth. John chapter 3 verse 5 said the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. It didn't say, it's very interesting pastor, it didn't say they believed Jonah. They believed God. Jonah's doing the preaching. Thank God for the Holy Spirit of God doing the convicting in people's lives as we declared to them the greatness and the mightiness and the holiness and the righteousness of the Almighty God. And God begins to speak into their heart and they believe God. Listen, uh, the world needs to hear from God, but we're the ones that ignite that in their ears. We need to cry aloud the fear of the Lord. Let me say number two, there's a need that we cry over sinful sinners. The Bible said in verse number two, their wickedness. We need to cry over sinful sinners. Not, I, we, we, we take a person and we make them one with their sin and then we hate them. But the sin is the same as our sin. It's wickedness before Almighty God. But the sinner is a soul. And that soul needs Jesus Christ. And it's easy. It's easy when wickedness raises up its head. Boy, you hear the news and all that. Before you know it, you're hating everybody on the news. You're hating every, every politician. You're hating them all. 
there's a sinner right there that needs the Lord Jesus Christ. What if God saved them? Hey, you don't know. What if the people of God got so broken hearted over sinners in this country that we cry out for sinners? It needs to be a cry for the sinful sinners. God forgive us for taking a stance of self-righteousness and boxing ourselves into our walls and just saying, Jesus, please come take us home. It's wicked out there. And God said, get out there. Love the sinner for me. Get out there. Shine the light to the sinner for me. Need to cry for the sinfulness of the sinners. Their wickedness is coming up before the Lord God Almighty. And that ain't a good thing for any human being. To cry, to utter a loud sound in distress. Oh, dear sinner, stop your ways. Not blasting them. Not calling them derogatory names. Why would they listen to us after we just sat there and called them derogatory names? But to cry out in distress at them. Sinner, stop. Sinner, stop. You need to come to the Lord God Almighty. The people of Nineveh were some of the most horrible, wicked people that have ever walked the face of this earth. They did terrible things to their prisoners of war. They would rape the women. They would murder the children and the babies just for the fun of it. They would take the men and skin them alive. Then they would cut off their heads and build pyramids with their skulls as though to say, we conquered this city. I'm talking about an arrogant people, a prideful people. But when the man of God come in with the word of the Lord, they heard God and they fell on their face before God and repented of their sin. God help us to cry over sinful sinners. Thank God for his mercy. You shouldn't have got in. Who are we to decide anybody can't get in? We shouldn't have got in. We didn't deserve to hear the gospel. Hallelujah. The preacher preaches. He don't have the power to change lives, but God sure can. If we just get the message out with kindness, the message out with the charity of Christ, the love of God, with a broken heart and over sinners, instead of some kind of hated hatred, anger, wrath-filled, righteous indignation, God break our heart for sinners tonight. The heathen are dying and going to hell, and it's easy to say, let God destroy them. They filleted the skin off of live men. They've taken babies and run swords through them just for pleasure. Let them die and go to hell. But I'm telling you, that's not the heart of God. God said he's not willing that any should perish. Thank God tonight, let's cry for sinful sinners. God, break our hearts. Stephen Alford said this, revival restrains the righteous anger of God, restores the conscious awareness of God, and reveals the gracious activity of God. That's what revival is. That's what revival is. The gracious activity of God. It's not God railroading them before our eyes and us do like the sons of Zebedee and watch God burn them all up. That's not revival. That's not the right heart of the church. It's not the right heart of God's people. Revival is watching God do gracious activity among this world, among the lost. I'm going to want to say number three, there's a needed cry for the faith of the saints. Let me show you this. The Bible said in verse number three, but Jonah rose up to flee. Jonah didn't want to. There's a lot of saints right there tonight. They say, statistics say, since quarantine of March of last year, 18 months out, whatever that'll be, you do it, it's the things before the end of this year. They say one in three churches will close, and two in five Christians will no longer identify as, as a Christian. Jonah didn't want to go. Jonah didn't want to rise up to the occasion. 
In Sunday school, he brought out how that Daniel and the three Hebrews stood above everybody else, but everybody else that Israel could have stood up to and made, made a big splash for the Lord, but there ain't the four of them in the book of Daniel. Jonah didn't want to. How many Christians tonight are not rising up in Christ and not rising up in victory? They sang, they sang living by faith until 2020 came and they had to live by faith and then they didn't want to do it. Jonah didn't want to do this. And we need to cry, listen, we need to cry for the faith of the saints. This burdens my heart like nothing else I preach. The Bible said Jesus posed the question, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith? It's a negative connotated question. It is indicating he's not going to find any faith or he won't find much at all. Don't you want to be one of the ones in faith? Don't you want to be one of the ones in the final remnant, if you will, when Jesus comes and gets his bride? Uh, listen, tonight it ought to break our heart when we see a saint uh, that's lost faith and doesn't want to get up and doesn't want to go and doesn't want to rise up. Don't kick them when they're down. God help. Get broken hearted over it. We need to cry with the faith of the saints. I want you to notice there's a distinction I thought of on the way to church here tonight. There is a stark difference between Jonah the prophet and Paul the apostle. And here's the difference. When you look at Jonah's life, he's by himself all the way through. When you look at Paul's life, he's always surrounded with an entourage. Luke right there with him, writing things down. Luke said, we is in Eurachlodon, and we, me and Paul, had left all hope. But I wonder what Luke was doing in that loss of hope. Maybe he was stoking Paul, say, Paul, surely God will do something. Surely God will do something for us, Paul. Surely God will move. Sure. I don't know, but I'm telling you, Paul was surrounded with other men and women that stood, Priscilla, uh, Priscilla and Quill and other men and women that loved God and, and would pump, uh, pump up his faith. You listen to me tonight. Jonah had nobody. And I firmly believe it's not because nobody liked Jonah. It's because Jonah didn't want nobody. You close yourself up in your living room and draw your curtains closed and shut out the, the church and shut out the saints of God. It's no wonder you won't want to. It's no wonder you won't have anything. We need each other. Not a, we ought to cry for the faith of the saints. Pray for them. Pray God strengthen them. Pick the phone up and call them and speak life into their ears. Go by the house and show them the goodness of God. Don't kick them down. Cry for the faith of the saints. We see that Jonah is not only alone in his ministry, but I think we can safely assume he's alone in his entire life. When he comes on the scene, he don't have anybody. And at the end of it, he don't have anybody. He's the epitome of misery and, and, and pitifulness. Just, you close out the book of Jonah in a dark corner. Jonah was alone in his efforts for God. He was alone in his if you will, Christianity. He was alone in living his life. We cannot live our life by ourselves. We cannot live for God by ourselves. God never meant for that. It won't work that way. I, I, some of the stupid stuff they put out last year about uh, the, uh, you are the church. No, I ain't the church. I'm one little old individual saying to God that needs to gather with the church. I need the saints. I need Christians around me. I need others to speak life into me and encourage me. We need one another. Hey, it just breaks my heart. I'm telling you, it's Evangelist, it breaks my heart to see the lack of faith going on in God's people. You cry for the faith, the saints of God. Christians need to rise up in victory. You need to not look at these times as though things have changed with God because they have not. They don't need to look at these times as though the church now gets prevailed upon by hell because it does not. We need to have faith, children of God. Get you back to trusting God. 
get you back to trusting God. Don't get out there alone like that. If you need help, get you somebody that will strengthen you. Get you some good Christian fellowship. But God help us be broken and, and, and upset over the lack of faith among God's people. Revival is a work of God. Sometimes it's referred to as an awakening. Because in a revival, people are awakened afresh to who God is and what he would have them do with their lives. And everybody's saying, what are we going to do now? We're going to do what God would have us do with our lives. Revival is to come back to life. It's a cry to call importunately and earnestly that folks would come back to God, that God's people would have great faith. Listen to this. Revival is not the return of the wicked to God. Revival is the return of God's people to seeking God and living out His ways with one another. Must have faith. We need faith like never before. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You know how many Christians aren't pleasing God anymore and they think they are? They think they are. They're going to play it safe and think they're pleasing God. That ain't the way it works. Faith steps beyond the safety of the branch. Faith, faith says I'm going to go with God and I'm going to serve God and whatever happens to me happens to me. I'm, I'm, I'm stirred up when I read about Epaphroditus how he, he hazarded himself for the ministry. I mean he went the extra mile got dog sick Paul wrote about it. got dog sick he said he, he was just trying to serve y'all and he's doing better now but he's nigh to death sick unto death because he's trying to serve God he's trying to do something for God and God help us to, to cry over the lack of faith among God's people Jonah knew the miracle of God's mercy would happen but he did not want it I know, I know God will still yet do great things. But do we want it? Will we step up towards it? Will we grab a good handful of faith even though it looks like it's impossible? It looks like we'll be railroaded over or whatever comes to your mind. Will we grab a good bucket of faith and say, I know God will do great things. I know God will work through his children. How many Christians speak about God can but have no stories of him canning here lately? But then they're in their little living rooms with their little cliches. And I'm not talking about if you're, if you're shut in. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about seeing God's people sh shirk back from standing for God. And I'm not talking about arrogance neither. I'm talking about being the light. We're supposed to be the salt. We're supposed to make this thing taste good. Not, not them look at us and say we don't want none of what you're preaching and saying and your attitude and your spirit that ain't the way this works Jonah knew the miracles God would have he didn't want them we must be operating in faith we must we must we must be living by faith the faith of the saints say it like this I'm seeing it is waning Near about every pastor last year, with maybe one or two exceptions, said he's seeing 50 to 70 percent of his church come back. 50 to 70 percent. Faith is waning. It's got to break our hearts. Some at some point, we got to get brokenhearted about this. We got to get tore up about this. We got to go back and get them. We got to strengthen them. We got to go get them by the arm, lift them up, help them in the faith. So many issues. I wrote this. Uh, I want to post, I put out issues among the saints holds precedence over faith. Rest assured if you're holding an offense at someone, you cannot have revival. Let it go. Seek Christ. Be Christ-like. Man, we're eat up with division and we're just going to chop each other off and cut each other off and never talk. Cancer culture started in the church and it's straight out of hell. God help us be broken hearted about one another and our faith. You're responsible when God looked at Cain and said, said where's Abel? Am I my brother's keeper? It's a rhetorical question. Yes, Cain, you're your brother's keeper. Yeah. I created the human race to be intertwined. You're, you're your brother's keeper. 
Come to the New Testament, Paul said, no man lives on himself and no man dies on himself. We're responsible for one another. We can't be like Jonah and just live like we want in our little closed corner. We got to listen. We got to encourage one another. I gotta help your faith. You gotta help my faith. Gotta cry out for the lack of faith among God's people. But then let me give you this. There's a there's a desperate need to cry out to God. <laughs> Look, if you would, in chapter three a desperate need that we would cry out to God in chapter 3 verse 8 but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God and let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands this king heard the message Jonah never got to him. I don't know how the message got to him. I don't know if they shortwave radioed it to him. I don't know what they did, but it got to the palace. Within the first day, it got to the palace. And the king said, we need to cry out mightily. Don't just cry. We need to cry out mightily. In other words, here's what I'm telling you all, all the subjects of the kingdom. I'm not talking about throwing up a little prayer, God help us. I'm not talking about throwing up a little two and a half a second, God help our country. He said, I'm talking about get your sackcloth out, walk out into the field and clothe your cattle with it. Get some ashes and pour it on them. Do it to every beast in your home. Do it to every person in your home and cry out mightily unto God. We have a desperate need these days to cry out to God mightily. Oh, how we need God. I think we don't think we need Him because we got a stimulus or two and everything's good. So I guess He might have to let it go a little farther on us before we cry out and say, God, we need you with a mighty cry. We need Christians who are broken up before God broken over the recognition of our responsibility of life on this earth. Broken over the need that God would shine brightly in this world. I still say tonight nothing's impossible with God. In Jonah chapter 3 we see the demonstration of God's grace to a group of people who did not deserve it. There's no telling what God will do. If his people cry, to cry, to utter a loud voice in weeping, to utter the voice of sorrow and lamenting. Another Webster's 1828 definition is to bawl, to cry like a child. When's the last time you crawled in your closet and just cried before God? Maybe cried over your own shape, but just cried before God. Cry over the shape of the faith of the saints. Cry over the way God is being defaced by this world. Cry that the light of Christ that is collective among the children of God would shine like a bright candle for His glory. In chapter 3, Jonah got a second chance. Aren't you glad God gives second chances? Somebody preached he's a God of first and second chances. It really is. That's a little shallow. He's a God of life. You've had, you've had a half dozen plus yourself already in chances. He's a God of life. And Jonah got a second chance. I think that's where we're at. Well, if we would see it, we'd grab hold of it. There's no telling what God would do with some children of God. Grab hold of it with God and cry mightily with God. Lydia said four years ago, she said, well, if, if, if God's given us a space of grace, what do we do with it? I didn't answer fast enough. She answered better than me and quicker than me. She said, we get to getting the gospel out across America. <laughs> hey, wake up. It's time to cry before Almighty God. <laughs> if, you're, if you were disobedient like Jonah, you know how to stay that way. If you're a prodigal, like the prodigal son, you don't have to stay that way. Okay, how bad you messed up? 
God's a merciful God. Cry out to God. Come back to God. Boy, we need to call people back to God like never before. Listen, Jonah comes in here and he preaches and people just just start crying out mighty to God and God moves on behalf of one of the most heathenistic people on the face of this earth. What do you think he'll do for you, child of God? There's nothing further from the truth than to say that God is done with his children. Come back to God. Cry out to God. Lady, come on. Let me wrap this up. I want you to notice this. Let me, let me bring a couple things. I've been long enough. Let me, let me get done. I want you to notice this. In chapter 3, the Bible said in verse number 2, God said, Arise, go unto Nineveh. Now, the way we would read it is this. Arise and go, Jonah. But that's not the way God said it. Because the word and gives a space of time. He said, Arise, go. That quick. Arise, go. I'm reminded when he came to Abram, Abraham and told him to take Isaac up on the mountain. Told him the night before, he said he rose up early in the morning. He got after it. Hey, it's time to get after it. It's time to get going with everything. I mean fire up all eight cylinders of your Christian engine of your love for God and put it to the floor metal to the pedal to the metal get moving get going get doing get crying out for God you've got sinners in your life that ain't nobody gonna love but you <laughs> take some love of God to them in the morning <laughs> hey you got saints around you you know they're de- they're depleted in their faith you know that they're just a, uh, they're just a sunk down in despair and go fire them up for God there might be somebody you know that's no longer in the house of God. They messed up. They're probably out there thinking God don't want no part of me. They're probably like Pete thinking God don't want no part of me. But Jesus pulled them to the fire and said, do you love me, Peter? Go out there and get them. Go get them. Want to fill the church up? We can overfill the church with the broken saints of God if we just go get them. And then God help us quit hating a sinner. God help us to get a good handful of love for a soul that's going to hell. Weep over them. Might be your very family, somebody in your home. It's time, it's time, it's time to cry. Don't wait another day, arise and go. And God help us all to cry out to our God for we need him like never before. Let's stand and bow our heads. Father, we love you tonight. God, sure do thank you that you love every one of us. Bless the Lord God Almighty for his love. Hallelujah, God. Bless your holy name. Why you would love us. Who in the world knows, God, thank you. Lord God, I pray that you'd be with every child of God in here tonight. Help us, Lord God, help us. Lord God, there might be some on these altars praying for the loved ones or, 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 or co-workers. I ask you, God, to hear their prayer. Give them the words to speak. Arise and go. First thing in the morning, maybe even tonight, go to them. And cry over them. Tell them how good God is. Send them a Savior. Lord, help us as your children to get up with a fervor and a fire. Lord God, revival Christ. Jesus name hey did you know that IBC is now on iTunes TuneIn SoundCloud and Google Play head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today and as always thanks for listening